Okay. Go for it, everybody. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So our first day of spring, I think it's 60 degrees on my thermometer coming down here today. So I think that's probably what happens with our audience. They're uh, competing with the good weather. So let me uh, make a few introductory remarks about David. You probably already met him here in the audience. David Williams is a freelance writer in Seattle. He originally was raised in Seattle, but he went to college in Colorado where he initially studied physics. Can you imagine that physics? But switched over to geology. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Geology from Colorado College in Colorado Springs in 1987. And he was hired by the Canyonlands Field Institute in Moab, Utah. This led to a job as an interpretive park ranger in Arches National Park and then to Boston where his wife gradu attended graduate school in 1997. You must have heard Horace Greeley's admonition, go, yes, young, go west young couple. And they returned to Seattle where he became a well-established writer of natural history books and an occasional urban guide to, to the geology of the area. Since 1977, he's been associated with the Seattle's Burke Museum, initially in their education department, and more recently as a curatorial associate. David's a prolific writer. He has a collection of his books for sale outside in the lobby. I hope you've either shopped before or can shop afterwards. Um, I have almost all of these books at my, at my home and I've read them, they're very good. David maintains a geology writer blog from his home base in Seattle. He says his interest in urban geology was sparked by the use of stone in the, Seattle, in the downtown Seattle transit tunnel. More recently, he started to, a free uh, weekly newsletter entitled Street Smart Natural. So I'd encourage you to get on it. It's free, it comes out once a week. It's always interesting about some aspect of Seattle geology or natural history. Uh, he's been a frequent speaker and a frequent and popular speaker here at the Quimper Geological Society. He spoke with us in March of 2013 on his book, Stories in Stone. And again, in November, 2015, on reshaping Seattle's topography, which I think you'll touch upon today. He says, yes. Uh, in addition, many of us have attended his walking tours of architectural stone usage in downtown Seattle. So without further ado, I'll introduce David Williams as our speaker for Secrets of Seattle Geology today. We're just working with technology here and me. Just not the most techno person. Can you hear me on the Zoom? Can you, should I yes. be able to hear her on that? I oh my gosh. You. I just want to make sure that. Zoom hearing is great. Great. So it is an honor and pleasure to be here today. I want to just clarify one of the things that Michael said. Um, I did go to school uh, in college to initially sort of get a, a degree uh, that dealt with physics and engineering. And um, during my first class in engineer in physics, I took a quiz and I got a 16%. That's one six. So fortunately, I had taken a geology class and realized that I was much better at field trips than physics. So I decided to major in, in field trips, which is what we call geology. So now why aren't you advancing? That's weird. Just went the, why is technology doing this to me? That's weird, Michael, it's not. I'll just do that, I'll try that. So let me tell you, so um, as Michael said, I am a freelance writer based in the Seattle area. Um, I have been basically writing since I moved back to Seattle in 1997 and through a variety of different books, uh, exploring the stories of my home place, of my uh, landscape that I have really fallen in love with and expect to be there for hopefully till as long as I can in the Seattle area. And as a geologist, I'm always intrigued by that intersection between people and place. How are we impacted by the geology of the landscape and then how do we impact it? And what I wanna do in the talk today is address some of those issues, some things that I think are 
some people know and some people overlook and some things I just think are fun and interesting about the story of Seattle geology. So of course, as a geologist, I need to talk about plate tectonics. Uh, we are fortunate in the geological world that our foundation theory uh, is not controversial like evolution. No one seems to get too upset with plate tectonics. Uh, this idea that the earth is a giant avocado or a giant hard boiled egg is probably the better analogy with you have this outer hard shell, you have the inner, the mantle, uh, which is the white, and then you have the yolk or the core of the earth. And it's heat within the mantle that moves those plates, that shell on the outer part and moves them around. There are about 15 or so major plates on Earth, and they interact in a variety of different ways. So running down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you have a spreading center where the plates are pulling apart. So at one point, not too long ago, about 200 million years ago, and that's obviously not too long for geologists, you had North America, South America, Africa, and Eurasia all together, and then they started to pull apart. And basically on the east coast of, of North America, really nothing's happened geologically for about 200 million years. It's sort of boring. Um, is there any, if there's anyone from the east coast here that you'll probably, I hope, agree with that. Uh, but you can also have plates run into each other. So if you have a plate like India running into Eurasia, you get this big collision and you get the formation of something like the Himalayas. Um, in fact, you actually have the formation of the Himalayas. It's not like the Himalayas, it is the Himalayas. Um, or plates can slide past each other. The cl classic example is along the San Andreas Fault with North America and the Pacific plates sliding past each other and slowly, ever so slowly, bringing more Californians up into Washington state. Um, we've got about, I think about 40 million years till they'll all be here. Um, but so we can hold off for that. But in our part of the world, the plate boundary that is most interesting is what we would refer to as subduction, where you have a dense plate, in our case, the Juan de Fuca plate, diving under a much lighter plate, a continental plate, North America. And as that plate dives down, it starts to heat up. And once it gets deep enough, you start to get the volcanoes that we have in our state. Um, as you can see, they basically, the Cascade Range runs from Northern California up into, uh, actually goes all the way into Canada. We have five in our state. And of those, two certainly are considered to be active volcanoes, probably all five if you get technical. I mean, they've all erupted relatively recently and they're all problematic. And the big problem in particular for something like say Rainier for Mount Seattle, for Seattle's purpose, are the lahars that periodically wash off or just cascade off the mountain. So uh, those lahars are basically massive mud flows. One of the great things about Rainier is that we have a lot of ice up there. One of the problems with Rainier is we have a lot of ice up there, a lot of heat during volcanoes. Everything sort of turns into concrete, descends off the mountain. And if you look at the map here, you can see the lower part basically where Auburn is, that was prior to the big eruption of Rainier 5,600 years ago, Puget Sound extended all the way up to Auburn. Up, if we think going up the Duwamish and the Green uh, River or the White River Valley there. And then over time, as those lahars descended off of Mount Rainier, they pushed the mouth of the river further and further to the north, such that by about 1,100 years ago, we got the modern mouth of the Duwamish River where it is. So it's a very recent river, but it also points to this direct connection between Mount Rainier and Seattle. That, that, that connection is only, is, has been felt. We've experienced that. We've, we've felt the Laharas push it all the way to this area. So I think it's really fascinating to, to see how that, the mouth of that river um, extends. You can really see it on the lower map as you go from Auburn for, a little bit further to Kent Valley and then continue eventually all the way up to the Seattle area. Um, so it's one of the things I think about being, say, for the indigenous people. We know that people have been here the entire time that since the 5,600 year eruption, we know that people were there. What must it have been like to see your landscape change over time, to see this river, this body of water that what 
had been Puget Sound then becomes your river valley as it slowly pushes forward and forward and forward. Um, it must have been pretty uh, an interesting thing to experience, to say the least. Subduction also creates another issue for us, and that, of course, are, um, are, the, bulk, are the earthquakes. Um, you're probably familiar with the most, maybe the most famous one, the big subduction zone, the Cascadia quake, the one that the New Yorker article said everything east of Seattle or west of Seattle is toast. The coast is toast. Um, and during this eruption, January 26, uh, 1700 at nine o'clock PM, there was an estimated 9.0 or so magnitude earthquake um, out on the coast as that subducting plate, which is basically locked into place or sort of Velcroed into place. The Velcro broke out on the coast uh, where the red dot is and you had this snap of the land. And one result of that out on the coast ah, um, is what would be the dropped trees. If you've ever been out there and see that there's these uh, forests that disappeared out on the coast, or not disappeared, that died as the land was then lifted, uh, dropped out there and the coastal trees were, were uh, which had been above sea level were now dropped below sea level and died. Um, if that, if when that quake goes, it's going to be a huge, huge impact on this region. But then we also have, I'm going to just go back. We also have what are called the uh, the the um, the deep San Juan plate earthquakes. These are the ones that go about every 30 to 50 years in the Seattle area, um, in the Puget Lowland, um, as the Images show we had one in 49, one in 65, and then of course the most recent one in 2001. These are relatively low magnitude quakes. Uh, the one out on the coast, 9.0 in magnitude. The ones here, maybe 6.8, seven max. And that scale is geometric. So to go from seven to eight, the amount of energy release is about 30 times greater between an eight and a seven between a 9.0 and a 7.0, it's about 900 times more energy. Another way to think about it is you'd have to have 900 7.0 earthquakes to equal the amount of energy in a 9.0 earthquake. So this, when that one hits out there, it's me nasty. These ones, they're relatively small and they're also very deep so that by the time the energy reaches the surface, it's really dissipated. So it's not as big a deal. Um, out uh, underneath us. It's still, you know, people will die, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of damage, but relative to what could happen, it's not um, as dramatic. So um, I guess that's my hopeful comment for the, for the day. Uh, the big problem with these quakes, the 6.8 ones, and what's been experienced over the last uh, three of them, is the loss of, in particular, the bricks, the unreinforced masonry buildings that we have in Seattle. So you can see a couple photos from the earthquakes. Uh, the other issue would be chimneys. Uh, there seems to be a line of, not seems to be, there's a line of weakness in Seattle that if you look at the chimneys during these earthquakes, in particular, running from about west, running through West Seattle, it experiences more damage. And they did something, they examined something like 60,000 buildings and there were on the order of like 16 or 1700 buildings where the, where the, the chimneys had been shifted slightly. Um, we also see it with, as I said, these unreinforced masonry buildings of which just, you can see the green dots on here show the ones just in the downtown area and then the red ones around the city. A study was done a couple of years ago estimating that to seismically retrofit and improve these buildings, you're talking at least 1.3 billion, probably you know, several billion dollars to retrofit the buildings. And that's one of the big problems are these, um, these unreinforced masonry buildings. The other issue, and you may have remember from 2001, which was I thought was pretty interesting, um, were the areas where they, the land shook and you had these little eruptions of, of, of um, sand. Do you, do you all remember that? Yeah, well, I'll come back to that because that's just, I think that's so cool. Then, wow. Okay, there's supposed to be an image here that somehow has been subsumed by the um, technology. But what you need to imagine is what's, what's known as the Seattle Fault Zone. 
And the Seattle Fault Zone is a zone of weakness that basically runs from Bainbridge through Seattle, along I-90, through the two stadiums, what I call the Kingdomes, and through and up to about Issaquah. And this zone of weakness, this east-west zone of weakness, it's about two or three miles wide. I'll show, hopefully, I'll show you an image of it. But the problem, or the way it's created, is a, yet another issue that we can blame on California. Um, the whole mass of California, the Sierra Mountains, are slowly being pushed north by plate tectonic action. And that set of mountains then runs into the coast range in Oregon. And think of the coast range and the Sierras as two cars in a train. And so one car hits the other car. The coast range then also gets shoved north into Washington state. There's just one big problem. Canada is basically an immobile mass to the north. And so when that train runs into Washington, we're being squeezed in the middle. We're sort of the classic between a rock and a hard place. So we're being squeezed across this zone of weakness, the Seattle fault zone. And what that produces and what it produced in the, uh, about 1100 years ago was an earthquake, about a 7.5 magnitude earthquake, very close to the surface. And what further was problematic was the uplift was about 20 feet across that, um, up, uh, that break there. So here's the, here's the, salt, here's the fault zone run, running roughly east-west, as I said, about three or four miles wide. There's a series of little splays or little breaks, and it's not just one fault. It it's, it's literally is a zone of weakness. Um, one of the best places to see it is out at Restoration Point on Bainbridge. If you take the Bainbridge Ferry and you just as it head, heads in to sort of where the dock is and you look to the left, if you know where Restoration Point is, that point is out of the water because it was, it's been slowly uplifted by plate tectonic action. And during that last earthquake 1,100 years ago, it was thrust out of the ground 20 feet at one time. So the way to think about it is if you're standing there on the shore, say you're here, you're standing here on the shore, and all of a sudden you're 20 feet above higher than you were, uh, which I think would be a little bit disturbing. I, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe you're tougher than I am. The other spot we see this is along Kellogg Island. Uh, this is just south of, um, or basically just south of downtown along in Seattle, um, just below the, the West Seattle Bridge. And that if you walk out to the river, Kellogg Island, which is right on the Duwamish River, and you look at the bank there, what you'll see is what you see on this image, which is hard to tell, but it's a series of, of um, seashells um, of intertidal organisms, intertidal clams. And during that last earthquake, when they were uplifted by 20 feet, they were all thrust above the, inner, the tide line. And so that's why if you walk along there, you can see all these clams that just look completely out of place because they had been underwater. They had been living, minding their own business and all of a sudden uplifted during the last earthquake, uh, during the last moon of the Seattle Fault. So those are some of the, you know, the sort of geologic aspects of this zone of weakness. But if you look at the zone of weakness and you see where it is and you think about the fact 20 feet of uplift, the big problem are all these earth, these, these basically line, lifelines, if you will. So you can see that there are huge power lines, there's water lines, there's sewer lines, there's gas lines, there's liquefied pipelines, there's interstate, there's railroad, basically everything goes north-south. And if your rupture is east-west, so 90 degrees perpendicular to that zone, to where all those lines are, then if you break those, it's gonna be a little bit problematic. So one of the things that people really hope is that we don't get a movement of the Seattle Fault Zone um, anytime soon, because it's gonna be sadly catastrophic. I was maybe hopeful about the other faults. This one, forget it, not gonna be good. But we have benefited from the Seattle Fault Zone because as you can see on this map up here, so on the south side of the fault, the land has been thrust up several thousand feet over millions of years of movement of the Seattle Fault. And you can see that blue layer that's been thrust up. Well, that blue layer, what's called the Blakely Formation, has coal beds in it. 
And those coal beds, as you can see, have been brought to the surface. If we didn't have the Seattle Fault and we're on the north side of the fault, you can see that the uh, um, coal beds are several kilometers below the surface. We would not be able to access them. But because of the uplift of the fault, we have very extensive coal mines in King County. So the yellow dots show a variety of different coal mines in uh, just in King County alone, but they're throughout this region. And it's because of that uplift across the Seattle Fault that they, they bring this. Now coal is, a, to me, is really fascinating because it's one of the overlooked parts of the story of Seattle often. When people think or often describe Seattle's early economy, what most stands to, I think in most people's minds are salmon and trees, which makes sense. But coal was significant to this whole area and in fact led to the development of our first two railroads. Most of the coal was over on the east side of Lake Washington, areas that we now know of as Newcastle, Carbonado, Black Diamond, all of those areas um, got their names because of the coal. The challenge was how do you get coal from the east side of Lake Washington into downtown Seattle so that it can be shipped out and you can make some money off it? That of course was the big one. So you had three options. One, let's see if the technology works. Yes, my little, little boat is moving. One is you put it on a barge. You float that barge up Lake Washington to the portage between Lake Washington and Lake Union. You ferry those, uh, the cars of coal that are sitting on a barge over the little portage into Lake Union. You put them on another boat in Lake Union. You float them down Lake Union. You then put them on a train, the Seattle Lake Shore, or the Seattle and Coal, Seattle Coal and Transport. Seattle's first railroad, you take the coal from Lake Union to downtown Seattle. And that was our first one, first way to do it. The problem with that is that you have to touch the coal 13 times between the time of the mine and the time you actually take it off a ship in Seattle. So very time consuming, very labor consuming, very expensive to do. The second way is to put it on a barge take that barge and float it down the Duwamish River or the Black River and the Duwamish. The Black River was the historic route of, Lake, of outlet of Lake Washington. It flowed into the White, which then flowed into, became the Duwamish, and you could float a barge up into downtown Seattle uh, doing it that way. The problem with that was that the Duwamish River was so twisty and windy and overgrown. It would basically take about two weeks for a barge to go down the river make it to Seattle, and then back up the river to Newcastle. Finally, in 18, 1870s, late 1877, we had the development of the Seattle and Walla Walla Railroad. Now this railroad originally was built to connect Seattle to Walla Walla. And this would have been big news for Seattle because in the 1870s, Walla Walla was the biggest town in the territory. So if Seattle, a little podunk town, could connect to exciting Walla Walla by rail, big things would happen. That rail got as far as Renton. That's as far as it got. But in getting to Renton, it accessed the mines, the coal mines. Now you could put coal on a, on a car, a railroad car on the east side of the lake, bring it into downtown Seattle, just uh, putting on once and then taking it off at the end, very quick, very cheap, very fast. And in doing so, Seattle went from exporting about 7,000 tons of coal a year to over 130,000 tons of coal a year and becomes one of the biggest suppliers of coal on the West Coast and helps make Seattle one of the most important economies in Puget Sound. It really gives it that second boost. I mean, sort of like what happened in Seattle in the 1970s when Boeing crashed, when Seattle was dependent on just one economy, it was problematic. Seattle in the 1870s went from basically having fairly limited to then adding coal, critically important. Um, led to the building of this beautiful, huge uh, dock down. This is basically where the tower you can see is basically where one of the stadiums is right now. We're on, um, basically on King Street, looking to the, the east, the 
forested hill line, hillside in the back is Beacon Hill, um, the connection there. And what's I think is sort of interesting is you'll see that there's railroad tracks that where the photographer's standing that's up high, there's another lower set of railroad tracks. That's because in Seattle, the tide changes on average about 12 feet a day. So if, the, if you wanted to unload your or load your coal, if it was high tide, you had to put your boat at one area. If it was low tide, you put your boat at a different area. So again, a little bit problematic, but still a huge improvement and central really to the importance of Seattle's um, developing economy. So those are the, if you will, are the older geologic stories in the sense that we're dealing with plate tectonics, dealing with things that even though earthquakes hit more recently, the main geologic thrust, if you will, is a much older thrust. That really changes with the, with the last ice age. We've had about seven or eight ice ages in this area in the last 2 million years, the most recent about 20 to 15,000 years ago. And let me see if this video works. I'm gonna try and see if I can make it work. Give me one second. Again, technology seems to be troubling me today. Let's go back one. Where is it? There's supposed to be a video here. Well, I will just describe what happened. So uh, you're probably familiar with the, with the um, Ice Age story, but in case you're not, roughly about 20,000 years ago, 18, 19,000 years ago, a sheet of ice extends out of Canada. It's called the Puget Lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. So it's part of the massive ice sheet that covered much of Canada. That ice sheet extends down between the Cascades and the Olympics, goes to just a little bit past Olympia, and then it starts to re retreat or melt back to the north. During that time, at its greatest extent, it was about a about 4,500 feet thick, the ice sheet in Bellingham, about 3,000 feet thick in Seattle, and about 1,000 feet roughly at the snout of the glacier. So this is a huge, huge structure. We know the, the size from boulders that were pushed down along the side of the ice and left sort of perched there. And those, uh, we can measure that fit, that elevation that they are at, the boulders are at right now to get an idea of the thickness of this ice sheet. And as that ice moves in and moves out, it does several things to the landscape. It produces what, you, what I like to think of as troughs and flutes. The troughs are the big structures of the landscape. Puget Sound, Lake Washington, Hood Canal, those are carved not by ice, but by water flowing underneath the ice sheet. 3,000 feet thick ice, you can have a lot of water flowing underneath, and it carves into the sediment underneath, and it creates these very big structures. The ice, on the other hand, acts more sort of like a, a scraper, and that it acts, I like to think of it as a big, uh, the flutes is, as a big rake. So if you look at this landscape color coded for elevation, and you can clearly see that there's a series of north south trending ridges and valleys, as if a giant rake just scraped across the landscape and left all these structures in the landscape. If you've spent any time in Seattle, one thing you realize is that if you go north south, it's much easier to move through the landscape than to go, than to go east west. Um, I know I experience this as someone who bikes through the city regularly. If I leave my house and I want to, which is near Northgate, so basically along the freeway, and I want to go over to Lake Washington, I go up one ridge, I drop down one valley, I go up another ridge, and I drop down another valley. If I go downtown in, from my house, I can basically stay in a trough all the way downtown. So it's very, has a significant impact on, on how we deal with the city. Um, it's also, if you're a 16 year old and your parents aren't very good drivers and they try to teach you to drive a stick shift on a hill in Seattle, that's anyone grow up learning on a stick shift in Seattle? Yeah, it's not very fun. The other thing that, the, that we did is that ice moves in and moves out. It leaves behind evidence of itself, not only on the side of the hills, but also in 
the lowland area. As that ice melts back, as it's retreating back to the north, ice it, rocks in it that it had been carrying get dropped as what we call erratics. Probably the most famous erratic um, that anyone knows of is a Plymouth Rock, uh, where the people got off the boat and supposedly stepped on that rock. That is a glacial erratic. Um, we have a we had or have a bunch of them in the city. Um, the one on the right was called the Big Rock, and uh, that was blown up because it was in the way. The one on the left, which you can see two photos, I love the upper one that the Mountaineers group used to lead uh, rock climbing on this erratic. If you've ever been to it, it's called the Wedgwood Rock. It's um, in North Seattle, sort of in that sort of in the in the Wedgwood neighborhood. It's this huge, huge structure. Um, Four Mile Rock, which is a big beacon um, down off the Magnolia Bluff. So these erratics are scattered throughout the city. Uh, and we've lost several, as I said, due to being in the way. Basically, they just got blown up. Um, and we have only evidence we have are stories or this one photograph. I love this photograph of the, the guy on top, the sort of uh, Lewis and Clark pose. I don't think he's pointing at the other guys, but I wish he was, because that's sort of fun. As the ice moved in, there was another aspect of it. And this aspect of it is one that we also feel on a daily basis. And that was the deposition of three layers of sediment. So as the ice moves in and as the ice moves out, it leaves behind these three layers of material. So that if you go to someplace like um, Magnolia, Magnolia and you're looking at, at say um, Discovery Park and you look back at the bluff there, what you see of that bluff is what are labeled the Olympia beds. These were sediments that were deposited in a previous ice age, but then just above it, you have the advanced outwash. That material gets deposited. Um, it's a very fine grain mud, a uh, very gray. That's often what the debris cones are at the bottom. If you've ever walked along this bluff, you've probably come across that, 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 clay, that very dense clay. Um, and then, you go above the advanced outwash, there's a layer of sand. And then to go above that layer of sand, there's a very thin layer of rubble. Um, think of it, every hill in Seattle as being a chocolate layer cake, where you have a layer and another layer and then a thin layer of icing on top. And those three layers are critical to the story of Seattle because unlike some many cities like say New York or Portland, that underneath those cities, it's solid bedrock. Seattle's hills are basically just big piles of dirt, big piles of sediment piled up. They're not that cohesive relatively. What that means is that you can then alter the landscape. So oh, probably the most famous picture of landscape alteration is of course is Denny Hill during its regrade, that mound that's in the right of, of the image and the other two in the back, each of those are about a hundred feet tall. Each of those, the lower one third to one half is clay. The next one third to one half is the sand. And then the very thin layer on top is the till, the broken up rubble. What that means is that you can get rid of a hill the simple way that we all know how to wash away dirt or, or soil. And that's with hoses. So they used massive hoses, as you can see in this image. These are called hydraulic giants or hydraulic cannons. You start with water in a big hole, hose or big pipe. You feed it through subsequently smaller pipes. It shoots out at the speed of the speed of a cannon. You wash away the hill. You collect all that sediment. You run it through a series of conduits and pipes and you dump it out into Elliott Bay unused for any purpose. Uh, during the regrades, there was about 11 million cubic yards of sediment was removed about 10 million of that is in Elliott Bay. Uh, if you go to Elliott Bay and you go to, um, well, what's the hotel that the Beatles, um, Edgewood, I knew someone would know this, everyone knows. So if you go to where the Beatles were fishing, the Edgewood Hotel and you go just a little bit south, if you were to dive in, you would hit Denny Hill. So Denny Hill still exists. It's just now in the water, sitting there. Um, people are often say, all oh, Harbor Island was made out of Denny Hill. That's not true. None of the sediment from Denny Hill ended up there. Uh, you may wonder why didn't they use it for some purpose? And it's a pretty simple explanation. 
explanation. It's one you've heard, and unfortunately, we hear off, too often, politics. They couldn't agree with what, how to deal with it, so it was simpler just to get rid of the problem and not think about it. So that's what happens to Denny Hill. There are two other regrades in the Seattle area um, that people often don't think about, both in the International District. So you can see the area in blue up there. That's the International District, and the area in green is Dearborn. And I'll show you photos in a second. So that's just slightly to the east of the stadiums. You can see I-5 going through. So here is this wonderful before and after shot of the International District. So that area, again, they used the hydraulic giants and they lowered the International District. Uh, one way to think about that is if you've been there and if you're going east on uh, 9th Avenue and 9th Avenue goes directly underneath, uh, excuse me, e east on, um, yeah, 9th, and you go underneath the, um, sorry, you go east on Jackson Street. I apologize. You're going east on Jackson, which is the street on the far left up there. If you go east on that and you go under the freeway, which is at about 9th Street, 9th Avenue, the freeway is about 35 feet above you. What you need to realize is the hit top of the hill that was regraded, if you were standing at that exact location prior to the regrade, it would have been about 90 feet higher than it is right now. So the freeway is only about a third the elevation relative to what had been. So you can really see how clear it is. King Street, which is the street running up the center of the two images, was so steep that the street didn't even go through. They couldn't, it was too, were, the grades were too steep and they just had the street basically ended there. If you go to Dearborn Street, I'm sure you've all driven up Dearborn, you drive underneath this bridge, this is called the Jose Rizal Bridge or the 12th Avenue Bridge. And Dearborn, prior to the regrade, connected Beacon Hill to the north to the International District. Now it's, there's this big gulch there, this big valley with the bridge across it. That bridge is about 100 feet above the roadway. And you can see below the, the slope, the, the yellow line there is the modern slope, basically just about a one or 2% grade. Um, in places, the old Dearborn was 15, 18% grade hill. Uh, that elevation of the bridge, 100 feet above the street, that, ele that elevation of the bridge is basically the exact elevation that Dearborn Street was prior to the regrade. So that's how much that gap has fallen, how much they've removed from the landscape, washing it away. All of the material from Jackson and from the Dearborn regrades get dumped into the tide flats of the city um, and really make a big change. If you're not familiar with the story of the tide flats, um, it's one of the more astounding uh, sections of uh, where you would not recognize what it had been. So the image on the 1875 image, that area that's on the top, that's tan, that's what's referred to as the uh, tide flats of the Duwamish River. So the Duwamish River uh, historically ran into Elliott Bay. When it slowed down, it dumped its sediments. And if you were there in that tide flat at high tide and standing roughly where, again, say where the, one of the stadiums is, at high tide, you would be under about 10 to 15 feet of water. And it would have stretched from Beacon Hill on the east over to West Seattle. So this sheet of water covering the landscape. At low tide, water would flow out and leave this open expanse of mud. Um, and over time, that was filled in so that all of where you can see the lower image shows the tan to black. Black is made land, it's artificial land. It's sediment was dumped into that landscape to fill it, to raise the tide flat from below sea level to be about two feet above the high tide line. So all those buildings you go, you're in the downtown, uh, south of the sort of the stadiums area, all of that area is just about two feet above the high tide line. So it's really not a lot of change. And one of the concerns with sea level rise is how is that going to play out through that landscape there? And I'll come back to that in a second. The other issue, of course, are the landslides. The most famous landslide, sadly, of late, of course, was Oso um, up north. But a similar aspect of the story is 
the sediments deposited during that last ice age. Those layers of clay and those layers of sand, when, the, when it rains, water percolates down through that sand and it hits the clay layer that's the bottom of the hill, that's the base of every hill. And that clay layer is basically impermeable. So water hits it and then heads out, follows, goes down slope, follows gravity and emerges out. And in doing so, it basically weakens the hillside. It makes it susceptible to landslides. Uh, the one in 1990, uh, 1997 was caused by a, a big snowstorm. We had a huge snowstorm in 97, followed by a rain event. Uh, and all that rain melted the snow, weakened the structures and that area, which is the Magnolia Bluff, all of that slid in and converted those, those homes into mobile homes and slid them all in. There's three or four of them that slid, uh, pushed into Elliott Bay there. Fortunately, no one was killed. Um, this is really, you can see that example. Here's the, the clay, the sand, and that zone of weakness where you have all the landslides occur. Um, if you go to Seattle and you walk around um, and you carry this map, you're not gonna be terribly happy because if you're on a bluff, you can see all, it's hard to tell in this, but all the red, the sort of darker areas, those are all the areas that are susceptible to landslide in the Seattle area. Um, there's some great quote from one early city engineer who said, landslides have been, occur have been happening since before the time of which man remembers or some great sort of funny thing like that. But we have, it, there are records of at least 1,100 landslides in the Seattle area since they've been keeping records. And it's probably up, up much higher than it was uh, the last time I looked. So we definitely have a problem with landslides. Landslides or that contact more importantly between the, between the sand and the clay as water percolates out, what that means is we also have lots of springs in the area. Um, again, if you've been in downtown Seattle and you've been on Spring Street, it's called Spring Street, not because of a person, but because that's the first source of water in the Seattle area. There's a big spring on the west side of First Hill. They tapped that for water to bring it into the downtown area. I live up near Licton Spring, um, which is a fascinating place. It's one of the few places in Seattle that have a native name. Licton is a corruption of the word lictide, meaning uh, colored water. There's, as the water bubbles up there, it's, it's, there's sort of a reddish hue to it. Um, if you had gotten there uh, well before I lived there, they actually advertised it as a thermal spring. Um, I love the fact that you could get um, your lumbago um, cured. Does anyone know what lumbago is? is... Ooh, okay, so none of you have had it, so good. Maybe you've obviously all been to the spring, so. Um, but they advertised about 30 years you could go there and, and sort of, it was a, a resort in North Seattle to go to. Now it's just a little park that's a little funky. Um, so springs, there must have been hundreds, if not thousands of springs around Seattle. And again, they, are, they still exist. Uh, we like to think that they're gone, like we, we've somehow covered them up. But I'm sure if you've spent time in Seattle walking around, you have seen a couple of phenomena. If you have seen things such as horsetails growing, those, those very narrow green plants, those are indicators of spring. Springs, if you've walked along and seen water on a sidewalk um, that looks like it's maybe a busted sewer main or something, that's probably a spring still moving. I know there's quite a few in my neighborhood uh, where you walk along and it's just always wet because those springs are still there despite what we try to, to do, do with them. If there are springs, then there are streams. There are dozens of named streams. There's 48 named streams in Seattle alone, just in, within the city limits. Um, and when I started looking at the springs in the city and the streams, I had no idea there were that many streams um, running through there. The biggest is Thornton Creek, just a little bit north of where I live. Uh, but then there's a lot of these ones, just little thin slivers of water running through people's backyards or running through a little ravine or a little valley. So this though ties directly again to that geologic story of Seattle. 
glaciers, springs, seeps, all, all related. Um, and so you, again, you have different plant life, probably different animal life historically or before Europeans arrived that would take advantage of those situations. But as I said earlier, there is a problem, a big problem here. And that's in particular in the areas where we have made land, where we, we have created artificial landscape, where we have converted what had been maybe a tidal area or uh, an inlet and filled it in with sediment. Um, and what the problem is, as this slide shows, is what's called liquefaction, those areas that are purple in the illustration there. And liquefaction, I'm sure you've experienced, you go to a beach, you find some sand that's a little bit wet and you start shaking, and all of a sudden you start sinking into the ground as what appears to be solid starts to turn more into jello. And throughout the downtown area, we're down in the stadiums and along the Duwamish Valley, that area is all susceptible to liquefaction. As I said, during the last earthquake, one way that manifests itself is by eruptions of little geysers. So you can see the picture up there, it's sort of hard to tell, but both of those, you can see the sediment, the sort of little gray sediment um, that's erupted out. Because if you put, and what they did is they put asphalt on top of the area that was filled. So it was raised about two feet above sea level. You cap it with asphalt or concrete or something to that effect. You start to shake it in an earthquake. There's still a lot of water in that sediment that's been covered. And it's under pressure because it's confined by the asphalt or the concrete. If there's a zone of weakness, it erupts out as a geyser. And literally there were hundreds of these uh, that were erupting out during the last earthquake. I talked to someone who worked down at uh, Boeing and he said during the last earthquake, he could see where the old channels of the Duwamish River were, that where they had built the, the runways of Boeing across the old channel of the Duwamish because the land where the river was was shaking differently than where the where the where it was more solid land. So we still feel it. Um, you know, I think again this idea that we like that we've somehow defeated geology. We haven't, and certainly not in the Seattle area. Um, it's definitely problematic. Um, I'm going to try one more movie, and I'm not the way my luck is going. I'm not. I'm not even going to try it. Um, so one of the problems with the Seattle area, another one, I just keep telling you all problems, the Seattle Fault, when it last moved 1,100 years ago, it produced a tsunami in the Puget Lowland. There was, and we know that because they found it, a tree at a Discovery Park where the sewage treatment plant is along the water there, and that tree had been washed up by a tsunami, and they also found a layer of sand there. So they did computer simulations to see what would happen if a tsunami hit Seattle now. And what they discover is the whole area along where Harbor Island is, the whole area between Queen Anne and, Mag and uh, Magnolia, all those areas are going to be susceptible to water inundating the landscape and weakening the landscape. Um, so it's one of the major concerns Spot for emergency planners in Seattle. Not only do you have to worry about the lifelines breaking when you have a movement in the Seattle Fault of those rupturing, you have to worry about a tsunami in hitting Seattle, multiple waves coming in, washing away areas like Harbor Island or the Inner Bay area. So my bit of advice is next time an earthquake hits, do not, do not go to Harbor Island and look, looking for safety. It's probably the worst spot you could be. That being said, if you were in either of the two stadiums, you were probably in two of the safer places because both those buildings were built after we understood that there was a Cascadia subduction zone, this massive 9.0 earthquake. Uh, and after we understood that there was a Seattle fault zone. And so they're engineered much better. They're probably two of the safer buildings um, you can be in. So if you're a sports fan, it's good news. Not much else for our teams, but... Um, that's a whole nother issue. And I want to
leave you with sort of thinking about, uh, to me, the way I, I start try and put this in perspective um, and the story of Seattle. And I cannot separate the story of Seattle from the story of its landscape. That, that has had such a huge influence on the development of the city. I talked to a geologist once who said, I think if people knew what the geology story of Seattle was, we wouldn't have settled here because it's so many problems. But it's part of the story of Seattle. And it's really, I think, part of the DNA of Seattle in the sense of how do we deal with the geology of this city? Uh, what have been the biggest projects in Seattle over the last handful of years in terms of massive infrastructure projects? Both of them have had to deal with geology, building the new tunnel under the city because the viaduct was going to fall in an earthquake and now putting that road in a tunnel that's much better built, much uh, de designed for potential earthquake problems, much safer. The seawall that we've been rebuilding in Seattle, same thing. It's not only built to be more seismically resistant, but also another problem that's obviously part of Seattle's story and every store, every city in the country that's on the coast is rising sea levels. So we are, as we understand the stories of Seattle's geology, we become better at, at adapting to them. That does not mean that we are there, um, we still need to spend multiple billions of dollars. But the whole story, for me, of Seattle can be told through geology, from economic development to where people live, to building uh, codes that go in, to how we deal with electrical um, issues, transportation issues, communication issues, all of them revolve around the geology that underlies Seattle and makes it, I think, for many people, really a wonderful place to be, not because of the problems, but because of the beauty of the landscape that we owe to the geology. But there's also that downside, of course, of the city and the potential for major, major problems. Um, it's probably not what you really wanted to hear, but then you live up here. So it's everything's great in Port Townsend. Um, I don't think you have any geologic issues up here, so everything's good. Um, I will leave you just with my one final thought. Um, I purely selfish. Uh, if you are interested, I have some books out front, as Michael said. I also have this newsletter that comes out weekly that I've really been um, the way that I kind of try and let people know about what I'm doing, uh, all sorts of interesting stories. I think the last one I did was on the first fossils found in Washington state, what the story is. And um, then I did one about mountain goats. And next week is actually deals with uh, an early botanist in Seattle and uh, his work um, in, the, in the area up at what we call, some people call Alki, some people call Alki Point. But it's really way, my way, I hope to build a community. Um, and I always look for engagement from people. So those are my purely uh, all about me. Parts. Uh, more importantly, I thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. Thank you for those who are online. And I'm happy to try and answer questions. I'm not sure how we're doing it online versus how we're doing it in person. Maybe Michael knows. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks for suffering through this experiment. We're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, what I'd like to do is first take some questions from the field and the audience here, and then David can use the microphones to talk to the room governor who's on the chat line. And if there's any more questions that seem relevant, she can direct you to David and David can answer the question. Okay. Yeah. So you can go from here. Okay. And, and if you would, for the internet audience, repeat, repeat the question. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions out there? Don't be shy. Yes. Oh, great question. So what, so in the 1870s, what was driving Walla Walla to be the dominant community? Um, it had pretty extensive uh, agriculture over there. And so that was that, and they just had more people. It had been started a little bit earlier. So there were more people and the agriculture was really the, the key part of it that we were hoping.
Seattle was hoping to tap into that agricultural, both sort of trade in both directions. Um, but that was it. And that quickly, uh, that didn't last terribly long as Seattle just blew by everything and, and became obviously the dominant place. Yeah, so my next book is, uh, I've been working on for a couple of years now, is uh, Fossils of Washington State. It will be out in the fall of this year. Um, Liz and I have been working on this. I've worked with uh, Elizabeth Nesbitt, who was the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the Burke Museum for many years. And it will basically look at about 24 different either species or uh, ecosystem. So there's a chapter and these, then there's little profiles about each one, about 14 to 1500 word profiles, trying to tell a little bit about paleontology, a little bit about the geology and a little bit about the human history. So anything from the sloth found at SeaTac airport to looking at trilobites from Eastern Washington to this really unusual animal found out on the coast called Culp Culpanomus, uh, which there's only only been two specimens found. It's it sort of looks like a bear and sort of looks like an otter, and they really don't know what it is. Uh, but they uh, they were marine invertebrate eaters, and they're really cool little animal. And it's a wonderful story because the original fossil was found by a school teacher out um, on the coast, and then she she found it. A variety of other fossils get them to the Burke, and then from there they eventually made. A, further the story. But it's been really fun to work on. So that's the University of Washington Press, but it's going to be called um, Spirit Whales and Spirit Tales. So we were very proud of that. Some people are probably like, yeah. but that was fun for us. But we've had fun working on it. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. 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 Are there questions on the chat? I, I don't have my glasses. Well, I guess I do have to put them uh, uh, on. That's all right. I'll read them to you. So how do we sign up for your newsletter? I think your last slide told them that, right? Oh, yeah. So the question was, first question was, how do you sign up? High technology. High technology. How do you sign up for my newsletter? Uh, through my website, geologywriter.com. There is a link on that to the website to sign up for the newsletter. So it's just a free click. You click through and it has gets all your information and um, you will only get periodic letters from my um, rich uncle in uh, Zambia. Only, only every other week does he write you. So Bill and Marianne uh, write, are, there, are the clay layers lacustrine? Lacustrine. Yeah. Are the clay layers lacustrian? Are they lake deposits? Yes. Yeah. So as the the ice moved into the Seattle area during the last ice age, a large lake forms in front of the uh, the glacier, roughly where Puget Sa much of Puget Sound is, and this very fine clay fine grained clay was deposited in the lake, settles down, and forms those clay layers. It's about anywhere between a hundred or two hundred, three hundred feet thick, depends on where you are um, in the Puget Lola in the Seattle area, but yeah, it's widespread. It is called the Lawton clay named for Fort Lawton, which is where Discovery Park is. And Lawton was named for somebody. That's what I remember about who that person is. <laughs> I wish I could tell you more. So, so Lean Walker asks, she loves your books. Is the Whidbey fault connected in any way with the Seattle fault? Is the Whidbey fault collect, connected to the Seattle fault? I believe so. Is that is that does anyone know? I think the I think the Whidbey fault system is part of the Seattle fault system. It's part of that squeeze of the land being squeezed uh, by that uh, between the Coast Range pushing into into Washington and Canada not moving. So everything in the lowlands is gets squeezed. So there's a fault system at Tacoma. There's one in Seattle, and I think the Whidbey system is also part of it. But I'm not 100 percent positive. That's all for online. Okay. 
Yes, Jeff, another. When did the, the regrading uh, get finished? So the first regrade starts in 1897. And there's a very small regrade in 1897. They move about 100,000 cubic yards, basically along First Avenue. And then there's one in 1903 that moved 600,000. Another one in 1907, 600,000 cubic yards. 1908 to 1910, five and a half million cubic yards. And then 1928 to 1930, about four and a half million. So it ends on December 10th of 1930. And there's a wonderful picture from that day of the mayor driving a, they let the mayor uh, drive one of the big excavators. And he just has this total, excuse my language, shit eating grin on his face. And it's like, why you get, why you would want to be mayor? It's because you got to move the, and it says last shovel full of dirt. And the mayor's in there. And he's just like, yeah, it's really funny. The hill was level. Danny Hill had been flattened and there was. Yeah, so they had done Jack. The Jackson Street regrade was uh, 1909 to 1911 and Dearborn's roughly the same time. So there was there was a huge between 1908 and about 1912. They moved the five and a half million cubic yards of, of Denny and then another about five million cubic yards between uh, Jackson Street regrade and the Dearborn Street regrade. They get there's some uh, they have about. 10 years, 15 years where not much happens, and then they start up again and they get Denny done and then they just stop. Major regrading. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Do people still refer to it as the Denny regrade? It depends on who you talk to. Uh, there used to be a wonderful building in Seattle called the Denny regrade building, but they leveled it for something really ugly. Um, and some people refer to, you know, it's where a lot of Amazon is now. And so sometimes people call it the Amazon area or Bezos's balls or whatever that big thing is that he built. Um, but the cool people still call it the Denny Regrade. And the modest people like myself. Is that, the, that it from the internet questions? In the chat, is there anything else in the chat? I mean, the chat. No, that's what I was. That's what I was oh. reading from. So okay. we got to the bottom of it. Okay, so that must be all of our questions. So again, um, it's been thank you for the online audience. I can't see you. Um, I assume there's thousands of them out there, and thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. And you want to? I just want to say thank you, David. Oh, my pleasure. I'm happy to, I'm going to walk out there and sell books to anyone who wants we'll to We'll take care of this part. Of oh, okay. How exciting. Okay. Thanks very much. So thank coming. you, everybody online. Buy books. Yeah.